Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that if you want a favor from someone, you can ask them in their right ear. Studies show that people prefer hearing things in, in the right ear and they're more likely to give you what you ask for. And if you ask them in the left ear, they're just less likely to do it. We think it's due to the brain's left hemisphere being the predominant area for processing verbal information. The spot you use actually for, for verbal processing and language processing is a couple inches up from your left ear. And you can actually stimulate that with a transcranial direct current. And I've done that. I've also put a laser there, which I don't necessarily recommend you do. So. It's, it's very interesting that that little difference could matter. And if you have a friend who doesn't hear well in one ear and you remember that and you always ask them in the ear they can hear from, they'll totally notice and just be happy that you did it because it's kind of annoying to only hear out of one ear and you can actually reduce their stress greatly. So be a good friend, know which ear people can't hear out of and remember it. Today's guest, is uh, an awesome guy, a guy who's been on the show before and a guy I have a great deal of respect for. It's Stu Friedman, who is a professor at the Wharton School of Business. He's the founding director of the Wharton Leadership Program and he's part of their work-life integration project. He's been a professor there since 1984. He was my professor about a dozen years ago there where he actually taught me uh, some of the things about leadership and he's in fact the first guy I ever worked with who quantified as as in running self experiments this idea of how, how am I putting into something and what are the results I'm getting? And it's that what results am I getting from X amount of effort that really matters. So Stu's back on because his new book called Leading the Life You Want, Skills for Integrating Work and Life is uh, is just out. And it's a, it's a remarkable book. And what he's done is he's looked at critical skills for uh, just bringing together work and life. But he didn't just kind of talk about what he'd talk about in a course. He went out and uh, sort of looked at a few famous people, uh, guys like the CEO of Bain and Company and Sheryl Sandberg and US Navy SEALs and Michelle Obama and used that interviews use those interviews and that research in order to understand what makes these people tick and how they at those very high levels of performance are making what they do at home and what they do in in their work lives match and of course that builds on the total leadership work that you can hear about on an earlier podcast so Stu, welcome to the show and just let's dive in tell me about this new book leading the life you want so you don't have to do the whole course over the four month period you can sort of click into the skills that are most important to you so that's one reason why i wrote this book the other it was, it was to offer you know skills education basically and exercises that anybody can do to develop these skills to practice them the other critique that i got from people uh was well this is all well and goods to you know this academic you know um four-way wins that sounds good in in principle but come on in the real world don't you have to just give everything up in order to be successful in your professional life and the answer is no even though Everybody listening here is probably thinking, ah, come on, the people who I see who are really super successful, they have made all kinds of sacrifices in their family lives and in their community lives and in their spiritual lives, their personal lives, their physical health, their emotional health and well-being. Um, that is the common mythology, particularly here in America, that you've got to give everything up and that the people we see, you know, many of whom are running companies, have made radical sacrifices for the sake of their career aspirations. However, when you look carefully at their stories, and when you look at the stories of the many, many people who demonstrate the opposite, which is that you become really successful in a meaningful way in your public and professional life, not by forsaking the other parts of your life, your family, your community, your personal life, and you're a great exemplar of this yourself, but rather by embracing those other parts of your life, investing in them, you know, those devotions, those commitments to your family, your community, yourself, that's what makes you successful in your professional life. And so for the last 10 years or so, my full-time MBA students, I've had them write biographies of, you know, great leaders that they admire. And I've also done a lot of study myself, and, and then there's people I know who all give lie to this myth that you have to trade one part to get you know, success in the other and demonstrate the opposite. 
So I wanted to put down on paper and, you know, uh, anywhere you, you can read on a screen, stories of obviously successful people who demonstrate how they become successful by integrating the different parts of their lives over the course of their lives. They, none of them have you know, perfect balance at any one point in their lives because that's impossible, but they are continually seeking ways of creating harmony among the different parts of life. And so in the first part of the book, I tell their stories. In you know, these six people, three men, three women, two from business, two from uh, public policy, public service, and two from sports and entertainment, to show how they illustrate these skills that I was talking about earlier. So I, you know, these New Yorker style profiles tell their story, and then I analyze their stories uh, according to the, the principles uh, and the skills that they, that they illustrate. And I, I think I've been successful in helping to persuade at least some people that, yeah, you don't have to give everything up to be successful. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, there's there's a sense of struggle that or striving that's almost honorable to have that people associate with success that isn't actually it's not necessary for success. Um, but there's I, when I look at the sort of modern modern business leaders talking about pers the perspective here, particularly women, you've got on one side like the lean in Sheryl Sandberg perspective. On the other hand, you have like the Ariane Huffington Thrive perspective. There doesn't seem to be that much overlap in the middle between the the sort of you know, kick ass and just push harder uh, versus, you know, kick ass, but make sure you meditate and sleep and take care of your body. It, it, are you finding that those two kind of edge perspectives are coming together in, in your research or in the people you talk to? Or, Well, I mean, the Samper case is an interesting one. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you read the chapter about her, you'll see that uh, she really does uh, very consciously and deliberately um, wrestle with that dilemma and I think she's a good example I mean now it's easy she's got billions of dollars she can do anything she wants but just you know coming up you can and, you know I, I start the story at the beginning and indeed all six of these people you know none of them went to private school uh, they all made mistakes three of them are on second marriages they've learned continually through the course of their lives and careers to figure out a distinctive way of bringing what's unique to their worldview, their talents, their skills to create value for the rest of the world somehow. Um, that's really the key. You know, in her 50-50 marriage with uh, the CEO of SurveyMonkey, uh, you know, they're negotiating all the time uh, yeah. about you know, who's going to be available, how for their kids. Uh, so I don't interpret Sandberg's story as one of, you know, Lean in means all in. It, it means, you know, getting home to dinner and being, you know, available as a mother. It doesn't mean that it's easy or that she doesn't experience a lot of guilt sometimes. But she's very conscious about, uh, you know, working with her partner uh, to, to the, you know, to, to be available to family and is engaged in all kinds of community initiatives. So I don't see this, this stark distinction, these, you know, as, as some as some people do between her and say Huffington or, or others. Uh, that's, uh, it's really cool to hear that because you had enough time to interview her and all. And whenever you write a book, and I say that now that my book finally came out, you're always looking at, at you know, being truthful and, and also like providing a service where, where people read it and they learn something. So everyone self edits the way they want themselves to be, to be seen, whether they do it intentionally or not. Uh, so it, it's cool in the form of an interview uh, you sometimes get around some of that. And so in your perspective on that is is that there's a more common ground than than what maybe what what I would pick up as someone who doesn't know uh, doesn't know Cheryl at all. And someone who I'm, I'm a I wouldn't say I'm great friends with Ariana, but I've certainly like met her several times. Uh, and I, uh, I I like her work and I think she's an amazing woman. Uh, so um, it, it's it's very interesting just to 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 hear not just the way we self-report, but the way someone else who's observing us the way you do as an academic researcher is really cool. So thanks for that. Yeah. No, I think it's, uh, I'd love to hear from your readers when they check out this chapter to see if they agree with me. Uh, you know, I, I put those stories out there as a way to try to provide a counterweight to the, you know, to the standard model that most people have of super successful people that they've had to sacrifice everything. But when you dig into their stories, uh, you see that you know, they've developed these skills 
in, in Sandberg's case, the skills that I focus on are conveying values with stories, um, building supportive networks, and resolving conflicts creatively. Uh, and she's really good at, you know, demonstrating those skills, but she's, you know, created them in herself by practicing and developing over time. When she first wrote the first drafts of Lean In, uh, as she told me, uh, were, according to her husband, kind of dry and boring uh, because they didn't have that that, you know, the stories of what actually happened to her and how her consciousness was raised about, you know, the story that she really wanted to tell about women's advancement and the barriers that they face and what they have to do to overcome them and what we as a society have to do to help women to lead the lives they truly want. Uh, but the initial drafts of it were devoid of those stories and she had to kind of muster the courage to come out, as it were, with, you know, the kinds of uh, episodes that, you know, she was actually rather shy about conveying. So, you know, that's that's just one one of the skills that, that she illustrates well, this notion of being able to convey your value your values through the real stories of your of your past history and to bring other people closer to you and to make yourself more credible. So, you know, these stories I think do make the case, at least that was my goal, and that's what most people who've read them say, yeah, I could see how uh, these people haven't I mean, of course, you have to make some sacrifices in life. I'm not saying that, you know, you can get you know, to where you want to go without having to make some choices. Of course, of course. And that there's not disappointment and even, you know, tragedy along the way. But um, what, I've, what I've seen is that most people can get closer to leading the lives that they truly want if you kind of focus on how to do that. And what I'm offering here in this book is some evidence-based uh, means for how to develop the skills to, to get you there. And the name of the book is Leading the Life You Want, Skills for Integrating Work and Life. You can pick it up at your favorite bookstore, pick it up online. And uh, Stu, you, you've spent a, a huge number of years studying this stuff, so I, I think you did a, you did a great job on, on the book. And I, I would encourage you, if you're interested in this whole how do I deal with the work stress thing, and a lot of people listening right now, you are interested in that. That's one of the reasons that you listen to Bulletproof Radio is to learn about these things. Out of those six stories where you dug in really, really deep, what are maybe like the, the two most important things that stood out? If you, you sort of do the mini statistical analysis of this and you just think about it like, like all right, what, what do I take away from, from that research? Uh, I think the most important thing is something that's going to be obvious to probably most of your listeners uh, and easy to grasp, but not so hard to, uh, not so easy to execute on. And that is to be uh, to be honest about what it is that you really care about in your life. Um, and you know what what these people demonstrate, each in very very different ways, uh, is a, a kind of courage to uh, explore. Uh, who they are in terms of what their purpose is in their lives. Um, and again, it's, it sounds very easy and simplistic, to, yeah, but I, I am always amazed uh, when I encounter, as I do almost every day, people who, you know, they take up these exercises and they realize, wow, uh, so that's what I stand for. Uh, you know, uh, most people don't address these kinds of questions in the in the hurly burly of everyday life in 2015. Here we are. Uh, most people don't take the time, even just a few minutes, to explore through meaningful, you know, introspection and, and dialogue with trusted advisors and friends. What do I stand for? Where am I going? Uh, so they have an idea about what is important to them. And that is the touchstone. You know, that's the anchor. It evolves uh, over time. You know, if you'd have asked me, uh, you know, when I was even your age or earlier, you know, like in my 20s or 30s, uh, what was important to me, I would have told you something very different than what's important to me today. But having a sense for what matters, that gives you the clarity of uh, decision making that enables you to do the really important work of saying no to many things and to focus your attention and energy on the things that matter most to you. And then the second piece is to know who matters most. And that too 
is a very challenging thing. As you may recall, Dave, when you did this stakeholder analysis in my class, you had to think about, well, who really matters to me in my home environment? Who really matters to me in my work and career? Who are the people who I, or groups that I care most about in the community, in the world, in my friendships? And just going through that process of thinking through who matters to me now, uh, is, is, it's, a, it's not a natural thing. <laughs> so you gotta invest some effort in doing that, but these you know, exemplars, and the hundreds of others out there like them, they're, they're clear uh, and they continue to explore, well, who matters to me and what do those people need from me? What do I need from them? Uh, and so, so I, if you were to boil it down to those two, it would be knowing what matters and knowing who matters. So I, I like to say that, that I am a, I'm a master of self-deception because <laughs> I'm human. <laughs> <laughs> but you're um, fooling me too, then, Dave. <laughs> so the the problem that I ran into, in fact, when I was taking your course, uh, you ask these questions in the form of surveys, in the form of these group exercises. But you have this this idea of, of what and who should matter. So those are the ones that do matter, except well, they actually don't matter to you. But it creates a, a disconnect, and yeah. I found it pretty honestly, pretty damned uncomfortable to sit there and, and go, well, like these results actually aren't right, you know, be, because you have to basically admit that you've been lying to yourself about what matters in order to figure out what really matters. How do people who are you know, driving in their car right now, how can they go about finding their mission or their purpose? Because that's not a small nut to crack. No, no, and you got to take it in small steps, and and that's why you know these exercises that I offer you know in the book are pretty simple uh, things to do you could you know I design them to be digestible chunks uh, you know that enable you to dig into you know what matters so this you know some very simple things so in terms of being real knowing what matters there's a dozen exercises there and you can choose the ones that seem to fit you well um, you know one of them is uh, to tell the story of the, the three or four episodes in your life history that have shaped who you are uh, it doesn't take a lot of effort to think about, well, what has happened to me in the past that has been that has been really influential in 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 help, you know, in, in shaping like my worldview and what I care about and what, you know, uh, I invest my attention and resources in, in trying to, you know, to make a difference. in. Uh, that's a really important thing to do because it, it's a grounding in your actual history. And and as a leader in your life. And I define leadership really simply as mobilizing people to get important things done. And you can do that at any level, at any life stage. Uh, and I see everybody as having the capacity to grow their leadership uh, continually throughout life. And indeed, these six exemplars do that. Uh, but just by doing that simple work of thinking through, well, what are the critical episodes in my history? You reveal to yourself, most importantly, an aspect of what matters to you. And you have the other benefit of then being able to try out perhaps telling one of those stories to people who don't know them. And that enables you to do the leadership work of connecting with other people, building trust by revealing aspects of who you are to them so that they know you better and they can see you as a person who, just like them, has struggled and who has faced adversity and has emerged as the person they are now and are becoming. Uh, so that's one, one thing to do. Another simple exercise uh, is to take a few minutes to think about 2030, right? We're in 2015 right now. So now it's 2030 in your imagination. Describe a day in the life of, you know, your, you uh, in 2030. You wake up. Who are you with? What do you do? What impact are you having? Just try writing that down. Uh, and I think you'll be surprised at how much that reveals to you about what you care about today. So this isn't a contract or an action plan that you're writing. It's, it's, it's a vision. It's a, it's a compelling image of an achievable future. That, too, is a window into what matters most to you. So those are a couple of the exercises that help people to understand what matters most. There's a bunch of others there too, uh, but you can see it's not 
that complicated. You just have to realize that this is something that is useful to invest in and, and to take some time to, you know, to develop your, your, your greater capacity as, as a leader, which, again, starts with knowing what matters. In my leadership class at Wharton, we had to do integrals. <laughs> Calculus. Um, and uh, I, I remember I, I, was, I was kind of laughing about that. I, I don't think it was actually uh, your class, but, but there's an, an, an increasing movement uh, to make even something that is as uh, psychological, um, uh, psychological, emotional, spiritual as, as leadership and, and trying to turn it into, into a hard science. Mm -hmm. And we've got you know, brain mappings and spec scans and EEG and you know, psychoneurobiology and, and Wellbutrin and, and all these things. How does all of that integrate with with the approach you have here, which is, uh, I, I mean, a little bit more, you know, finding your mission can't really be quantified in a meaningful way. At least I don't know how to do it now. So uh, how do you reconcile the model, one I support, by the way, um, that, that you're working with, um, with this sort of rigorous, harder science approach to, to solving the same problems? Yeah, I'm not a biologist. You know, I'm a psychologist uh, by training, and I, I wouldn't call me old school, but, uh, you know, I, um, I, I approach this more from a, a social psychological point of view. My, my training is in organizational psychology, and so, you know, it's... it's uh, it's it's well established, and this is not just a modern idea. It's actually an ancient idea that um, you know the, uh, the if, if you read the literature of philosophy through you know the dawn of time, really people were saying these same things. You got to know who you are, what matters to you, and you got to know who matters to you. And then in the modern context, using the technology available to us now and, and the cultural values that pervade, you know, in our society, figure out ways of meaningfully connecting with those people. And, you know, a lot of that comes down to conversation and, and figuring out ways of being able to listen and take in the perspective of the people around you. And these are skills, uh, you know, that, that uh, you can develop through practice. We know this. We have evidence of that. And there are ways of measuring, you know, skill uh, development and growth, uh, but a lot of those indicators of um, the kinds of skills we're talking about here are, you know, subjectively based. They're social. They're perceptions of other people. So, um, you know, the, the quantified piece of the work that I do, as you were mentioning a few minutes ago, is in the experiments that people do. So I, I like to have people think of themselves as as perhaps you often do, Dave, and that is as a scientist in the laboratory of your life. Yep. And, and what you do in, in the context of, of you know, my courses and programs and books is you design experiments. You have a hypothesis that is basically, uh, if I take this action, if I delegate this piece to that person, uh, what do I expect to be the intended benefits for me in my work in terms of my productivity, my, my ability to get results done that matter, in my family life. How's it going to affect my family life? How's it going to affect my community life? And how's it going to affect myself, my mind, body, and spirit? What are my goals for taking this action in this crucible, this, this small you know, this laboratory? So you boil it down to something you're paying really close attention to, and then you come up with metrics for assessing whether or not you're actually making progress toward that goal over, say, a six-month, a six-week period. So you're creating a small, time-bound set of experiments. And you know, part, the rigor in this model, such as it is, is in figuring out creative ways of tracking, you know, generating data. And it could be highly subjective, but it could also be things like, you know, how much you weigh, how much, you know, fat you take in how fast you can walk, uh, how, much, uh, how much money you can save in reducing waste in your business, uh, or how much new revenue you can generate through uh, you know, new products, or through expanding markets, or through you know, being able to make more sales calls, or you know, whatever it is. Uh, but it can also be you know, something highly subjective, like how your wife feels about you. So, you know, Part of the thing that 
I think most people find surprising and helpful in this process is that you can design experiments about anything, any action that you take that you care about. And if you take this four-way view, if you think about what's the impact of my action in one part of my life on the other parts, either directly or indirectly, you know, if you if you drink uh, the bulletproof magic, you know, what what's the impact not only on your weight, your health, your sense of energy, but also how does that affect your relationship with your kids? How does that affect your uh, your ability to connect with your your clients? How does that affect your relationships with your friends? If you then figure out, well, how would I measure that? I I, I have, uh, I'm always amazed at how creative people are in coming up with metrics that are relevant for them. So it's metrics driven, it's about results, because it helps you to see, well, after a period of four to six weeks, what worked, what didn't, what did I learn? And you use that practical knowledge as a scientist in then evolving your practice over time. Well, what I learned was that uh, you know, when I delegate, I have a difficult time trusting, you know, that it's going to get to, so, you know, and that's what blew that experiment and made it a failure. So what do I do differently next time? Uh, so you become more skilled at designing, you know, the important initiatives that you can take from the perspective of all the different domains and gathering data in that process, whether it's objective or subjective, is an important part of, you know, the learning enterprise of the scientist. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question, though. No, I, I think you did. And, and the idea is self-experiments matter more, uh, is maybe the way I would attempt to boil all that down. Because, well, it, if you do something and it, I, I would like to say, objectively makes you feel better, but there is no objective measure of whether you feel better. <laughs> it, it's a subjective measure because it's what's going on like in your head and in your heart, and you know when you're feeling better. And uh, one of the things I did for about a year is that I just came up with a numerical score every day. Yeah. And it, it was like, okay, how satisfied am I? In fact, I, I looked at your four domains from back in the Total Leadership uh, book and the course that I took. I said, right, I'll, I'll boil those down into one number because I'm too lazy to write down all of them. But every day I'm just going to put down this one number on a scale of 1 to 10. How satisfied am I with my life, with my job, you know, with my relationships, and with my health? I think were the four things I did, just from memory. And every day I'd write a number down, and I was tracking that in relation to, uh, actually, uh, it was a talk I gave uh, at a Quantified Self talk in, in relation to, um, like, frequency, well, I'll just put it out there, uh, frequency of sexual activity. In other words, nice. So, and what I found was surprising because the, the idea of, of a, at least for men, of having an orgasm hangover where you're cranky the next day, like, I actually don't like life the day after. <laughs> and, really? Oh, yeah. And I was trying to disprove an old Taoist or Taoist kind of teaching that turns out <laughs> to be at least accurate in my case. Um, so it was a fascinating experiment, but the idea of just, it was just a number, but anyone could come along and be like, hey, Dave, you're full of crap because that number can't be verified by a third party. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> but still, like, I, rec <laughs> I learned something about myself that was kind of helpful. Um, and so what did you do with that useful knowledge, I wonder? Uh, all, all sorts of stuff, but most of it we can't talk about. You know, this is a family show. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> well, you know... Um, you're absolutely right that it's the data that matters to you, right? And, and some of it is entirely subjective. In fact, I have a piece in today's HarvardBusinessReview.org. You know, I blog there occasionally. It's called Get More Done by Focusing Less on Work. I love it. Uh, it's, it's in the productivity, you know, uh, topic area. Uh, just published this morning. And, and I, I report results there of a study I did of uh, my executive MBA students a number of years ago. And there's an assessment tool there that asks you to look at what's important to you in the different parts of your life. So you take that 100 points, divide it up according to work, home, community, and self. So you can do this little assessment, real simple. Where do you focus your attention in a typical week? Work, home, community, self. How satisfied are you? You know, just a 1 to 10 scale, uh, you know, subjective well-being in each domain. And then how well are you performing in meeting the expectations of the key people in the different parts of your life, in work, in home, in the community, and then in your ability to meet your own goals and expectations? So we, 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 you did this. In fact, I think you might be part of the study um, where, you know, yeah. before, just when we started the course and then four months later. 
And what we found and what, what's reported in this article today at HBR.org is that what happens when people undertake these, these smart experiments to better align what they do with what they care about and with what the people around them care about, what happens is what they care about doesn't change very much over a four-month period, but they shift some of their attention. And on average, in these 300 people that we studied, about 12% shift downward from work to the other parts of their lives. They end up with a better alignment because they wanted to attend more to their families, their communities, their private selves. Their satisfaction or subjective sense of well-being goes up in all four domains, as does their ability to meet the expectations of key stakeholders in all domains, including work. So less attention to work, better performance at work. Right because you're focusing on the things that matter, you've clarified what matters most to them and to you, you're less distracted uh, when you're at work because you're paying attention to the people who matter to you in the other parts of your life more, so you're less distracted, and generally you bring better energy uh, and attention and focus uh, to your work because, again, you're spilling over these positive benefits in the other part of your life into your, into your work. That's uh, that's remarkable, and it it's pretty cool that you can do that. And I, and I found the same thing. It, it, there's also it, this idea: it, no matter how much time you have to do a project, you can fill the time with stuff. But if you decide, all right, I'm going to consciously take time to you know to go to the park with the kids, uh, or you know to go to a, a go work out, or whatever it is that that's going to be renewing for you. Well, now you have less time to get the project done. And so you could say, the, if I spend less time on it, I'm going to do a lower quality job. And sometimes that's true. But there are other times when, look, just go with your gut. Like, you already knew how to do it. So you didn't have time to basically spin yourself up on a spreadsheet model and get all tweaked out. When you already knew how to do it, you knew what you needed to do, and you just did it because you had 20 minutes. So there may be, like, a little performance impact because you're not overthinking it. You think that's part Good of point. it? It, is that part of the effect there, or just is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, continue. You, you're ex, you're explaining it in, in a very a very very useful way. Uh, you know, you you're right. People tend to fill the time that they think they have available, and if you consciously bound that time, uh, you tend to eliminate waste. You also may rely on intuition more, uh, which, which is an area where I, I've looked at ways of you know of stimulating intuition and you're training your brain to pay more attention to what it's doing in its subconscious realms uh, because intuition is oftentimes bubbling around and it happens when you wake up from a dream it, it's in there but the bridge to it is not very easy to get to uh, mm. and one of the things that can do that is you have less time so like you had to do something and well the something you just happened to do is the one that your intuition liked even though you might not have got there if you had a six hour project and you had your cup of coffee and you sat down to bang it out right and it's it, it, it's hard to put any quantification on that. It's just more like a, a feeling or a hypothesis I have, but I think there's something to it. Absolutely. No, we know a lot about how we feel if we pay attention. Yeah. Uh, and and, and the, there's a whole lot of wisdom in that. It, but, you know, I think what we're both saying here, what we've both found in, in our respective, you know, war, uh, fields of, of work in this, in this area of, of improving life through intelligent, you know, innovation is, uh, you, you know, it requires paying attention. And that's a hard thing to do, which is why the peer-to-peer -peer coaching piece of this is, uh, is often really useful for students, for clients, for readers, uh, you know, listeners, uh, to build in some way of working with someone else who you're helping and they're helping you because uh, it's very easy to not pay attention to these things. But if you've got somebody else who's paying attention to you and asking you compassionate, caring, loving questions by, you know, being concerned about you and asking, hey, tell me more about that story uh, or that experiment that you're trying that's not working. What's wrong? You know, what are you running into? How can I help you? That makes a huge difference in you know anyone's capacity to be able to sustain the difficult effort of trying to create meaningful change uh, well said it's hard to do this on your own as i'm sure you know 
Yeah, the idea of having a, a mastermind group has really caught on in the past four or five years. So there's I have a bunch of friends who run you know, high-level masterminds where you spend a, a not inconsequential amount of money to go spend you know, several weekends a year or even a full week with a group of high-performance people. This is all taken from like Napoleon Hill's sort of idea of a mastermind, but these are in, in person. And I, I honestly consider that sort of thing to be a waste of money uh, for a lot of my career. Like, you know, why would you spend $5,000 to do that? Um, and I, I've actually changed my perspective on that because it, it's easier to do things when, when you have other people who are, who are operating at your level. And you've got to find your own, your own tribe like that. But if it costs some money in order to incent everyone to fly together to spend that quality time, rather than trying to just eke it out one-on-one, -on -one, you know, getting a group of, of a dozen or a hundred people who are, who are high performers, who are thinking about things similarly together, it, it does something. And I, again, I don't have the objective data there, but it's kind of obvious when you go. It's like, I don't have objective data that the sky's blue, <laughs> but I can just tell by looking. Well, we see this on even on Coursera, where people are signed up for free to take a course. And these are students, again, accessing this content, videos, and you know, assignments, and then discussion forums, and ways of sharing their exercises with other people. Uh, when you make some kind of investment uh, in this learning, and you become part of a community where you've got uh, leaders in the community who are skilled at uh, you know, where we started, the, the very start of this of this uh, of this conversation, creating cultures of you know compassion and learning and growth, and where that's in everybody's interest. What I found my my primary task as the instructor of this Coursera course, Better Leader, Richer Life. My main job, as it turned out, after I did all the videos and scripted them and. Uh, you know, designed all the assignments, refined them from the book, you know, so that they were going to work on this platform. My main job, Dave, was to be uh, conveying a set of cultural values and expectations that, okay, you're a part of a community here. I don't care where you are, you know, on the, on the earth, but you're a part of a community now, and your task when you join this community is to be helping other people to become the leaders they want to become. And if you're not up for that, then this isn't the right place for you to be, and and so let me, and here's how you can do that, and here are the steps you can take, and anybody can do this. You just have to want to do it and realize the benefits from it. And when you're in that kind of environment, it's it's remarkable what kind of magic can happen in terms of people feeling, uh, you know, capable uh, of taking steps towards you know uh, performing better in the different parts of their lives. And I've worked to, but it doesn't happen by magic, you know. It has to, it has to be made real by people who are concerned about, you know, caring about trying to make that happen. I, I've worked to build that same idea and that same feeling into Bulletproof into my company. With, with my team has uh, at least some of them. Different groups have regular biohacking calls where they all get together. Even though most people work remotely, they get together and talk not about like what we're going to do for the next, you know, the next thing on the blog or something. They're actually talking about like, what are the experiments they're running against themselves and sharing with other people the, the sense of community and shared accountability on how do I improve myself and how do I share knowledge with other people who are on my team so we can all improve ourselves and then use that to improve other people through our daily work. But uh, Bulletproof is kind of a weird company. <laughs> are there, are there companies, you know, that embody what you just talked about into their company culture, or is this oh, more yeah. like you have to leave your company to go have a group of people like this? No, no, no. There, there are a number of companies, and I'm, you know, I'm involved in quite a few of them in various different ways. Uh, I was just down at Motley Fool uh, a little while ago. You know, the investment advisors. Yeah. Uh, and they're based outside of Washington D.C. Um, and they're they're living that. You know, in a very serious way. You know, one of the things that's really striking when you walk into their their offices is uh, there's books everywhere. People are reading, you know, like real books. <laughs> they're not just uh, you know investment advisory books, but they're you know they're reading novels, they're reading history, they're reading philosophy. Um, that's just one little indicator that was really quite striking to me about their culture. You know, that this is this is a place where. Education is, is, a, is highly valued.
And that means, you know, learning at all different kinds of levels in different ways. So that's one example. Uh, Warby Parker, another Wharton alum, uh, Neil Blumenthal, is a, is a friend and colleague. I'm going to be going up to speak there in a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, what, what Neil and his colleagues have done is something very similar. I mean, he he's trying to role model the idea of living a full life and encouraging through all kinds of policies and practices uh, a way of making that happen for his people. And certainly what we see among students is that, you know, this is this is what they want, this is what they expect. And this is why many many students today, in contrast to, you know, decades in, in the past, they're coming to Wharton so that they can figure out how to create their own companies. You're a hero to uh, many of today's students because what you're doing is building out an idea that has market value that's based on what you're passionate about and you're creating a, a culture that is, uh, you know, consistent with the world that you're that you'd like to see your kids grow up in. Uh, and that's true. and that's that's just something that you know is just a lot more common today. Uh, th there's something changing, that's for sure, compared to you know the the early '90s. Like I'm going to work for a big investment bank, and you know that that's the end all be all. Uh, there's a lot of people who say you know I, I still want to do that. And there's a lot of people who say you know. I know I'd make more money that way, but it's it's not what not what I want to do, and that whole what matters most question maybe they're just answering it differently uh, because of you know what what whatever they've seen. I've got the market data for you, Dave. Uh, so I teach an undergraduate class to uh, the sophomores at Wharton who are responsible for leading the freshmen through their required leadership and teamwork class. Right. So so when you become a a teaching assistant for that freshman class, you have to take my course on leadership and teamwork so you learn how to work with teams. And one of the first things we do is we sit in a circle, 25 superstar Wharton sophomores, best students in business at that age in the world. And I sit them in a circle and say, okay, describe your dream job. And you know, just this past year, the, the 25 people, uh, one of them, just one talked about going into finance or banking. Wow, that's so different. <laughs> right, right. And when I did this uh, last year, the third person I came to, Nathan, said, my dream job is to be a stay-at-home dad. <laughs> wow. I that... fell off my chair. Are you kidding me? Can you imagine that? A Wharton software saying that his dream job is to be a stay-at-home dad? So things are changing. Yeah, he, he might be one of the the first uh, the first guys to go to college to get an MS degree instead of a, well, I guess MS is Master's of Science, but you know the old the old got an MRS degree, a sort of a derogatory say way of saying a, a woman went to college whatever 50 years ago so she could find a man, not because she wanted to be educated, but maybe the the reverse is, is true, which is kind of funny. Um, that is kind of funny, Dave. I'm going <laughs> to use that. I hope you don't mind. Oh, it, of course, of course. I'll attribute it to you, though, of course. Oh, that's even cooler. <laughs> now, in your book, I, I want to ask you a few questions about like some specific chapters in, in your book okay. that, that stood out, just to share some some kind of quick knowledge tidbits with people who are listening. Yeah. And one of them is, is in Chapter 7, you talk about failing to grow, and, and you talk about what's the worst thing you can do. What is the worst thing you can do? Yeah, I, I wanted to capture people's attention after you know reading these stories which hopefully are in themselves interesting to you know to hear how these six remarkable people have developed through trial and error these skills that have enabled them to integrate the different parts of their lives uh, the thing the two things that really stood out for me when I finished writing them and then analyzing their lives according to the skills that they best illustrated was first they, they have taken what is distinctive about them and somehow made it useful for other people, whatever that skill or passion is. They've, they've figured out how to take what they care about and make it useful to others, just as you're doing in, in, in a remarkable way. The other thing is the, the, that which you just pointed to, they don't stop learning. And I know this is a simple thing to say and again, not so easy to execute on, but uh, you, you read the stories of these great people and others who you admire. I mean, as your listeners might be thinking about, well, who do I admire in life? Uh, you're likely to come up with somebody who is changing a lot throughout their lives. 
you know, they've got some constants that, you know, that they hold true to, but in terms of, you know, what their interests are, they evolve, they become smarter. Uh, because, you know, that's, that's the basic human drive, I think, is to, uh, is to continue to learn. And the people who, who were good at that, uh, you know, they, they are able to just uh, live in ways that are more, more meaningful, more true. So, so the, you know, don't fail to learn, don't fail to grow is, uh, is like the big idea that, that emerged for me as I looked at, you know, these stories and, and the lessons that they taught me. Let's talk about being programmed to please, because you wrote you wrote a lot about that. What, how does that play into this this whole idea of leading the life you want? That's a great question. Uh, being programmed to please, I mean, and it's, this is you know more true in certain cultures than others, <clears throat> and it's different for men and for women, in you know in different parts of the world where uh, you're taught to be uh, you know selfless in in. Uh, Giving up your life, really, for the for the benefit of other people, and that's uh, you know when I talk about taking what's unique about you and making it useful for others, I'm not talking about giving up yourself. I'm talking about really embracing who you are and you know um, investing in that in a way that's going to be useful to other people. So a big part of the challenge for many people, and this is not just young people, although it's especially hard for people in their you know. 20s uh, is to break through the you know the constraints the nets that surround you in your youth when you know you don't have freedom in the way that you can have it as an adult which is to choose who matters to you so my students right now my full-time MBA students uh, who are going through the course as we speak we just met this week to talk about this very topic. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're looking at the stakeholder analysis, and the, the, the topic of conversation was, you know, how do I find the courage to um, to choose the people who matter to me, and to negotiate with the people who surround me? You know, the 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 terms of our relationship in a way that are going to be mutually beneficial so that I'm not just a slave to other people's desires. That takes effort. Um, the good news, of course, is that you know, there's skill involved here that you can learn and you can practice, but you don't get better at it uh, by thinking about it. You have to do it and then see what works and what doesn't. And that you know, that requires an investment in, in your education and development. Uh, but, you know, again, there's, there's really good news here, and that is if, you're, if you want to, you can change that. And, and one of the big takeaways for many of the people who read my books and take my course is they, they come to see that they have a lot more freedom than they thought they had. And indeed, the original impetus for this whole approach, when I first came up with it at Ford Motor Company in you know, 1999, was to try to change the culture of Ford Motor Company. That was the, that was my job description. I was to create a change to the culture of a uh, hundred year old iconic manufacturing company, and 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 this was one of the ways that we that we tried to do that was to say to people, look, you know what you care about, you know who the people around you are that matter to you, and you know you can discover what they care about. Talk to them discover you know, what they really think, which is probably a little bit different than what you thought they think about you, and then come up with some ways of making changes that are good for them and good for you. And that concept of pursuing the four-way win, that really helps to liberate people from you know, the, the power of you know, programmed expectations because you're taking systematic action, conscious, deliberate action that's designed to not just advance your own goals, or not just advance other people's goals, at you know at the um, you know uh, and, and to forsake your own, but to take leadership action, which is to you know to to move in a direction that's good for you and for them. So that frees you from feeling selfish or guilty, because what you're doing in taking care of yourself is actually becoming a better father, or a better employee, or a better friend. And when you think of it in those terms, it's not like you're just doing it for you. And it's not like you're just doing it for your parents. You're 
thinking about, well, what do I care about? And now how can I you know, move forward in my life in a way that's going to be good for them and for me? Uh, that's really well said, the, the idea of, of hacking selfishness or guilt so that you know, they, they aren't what you thought they were. And, and that's one of the reasons I, I recommend people read Leading the Life You Want. And one of the reasons I wanted you back on the show, because writing about that sort of thing is it's hard to do, especially in, in an authentic, helpful way. And I think you've uh, you, you've earned your chops <laughs> to do that. Uh, it you know it, it shows. We're we're coming up on the end of the show, and there's a question that I ask every guest, and I haven't figured out what to do when, when I have the same guy on twice because you've written two really good books. But the question is, what are your top three recommendations for people who want to perform better in life, not necessarily in work? And you probably don't remember your answer last time, so I'm going to ask you to run through, all right, given everything you know from Wharton and not, the three things that, that, that I should know and that everyone listening should know, uh, and we'll see if they match your last ones. <laughs> No pressure. All right. No, it's, uh, th this is a tough test, but fair enough, Dave. Um, uh, you know, it, it boils down for me to uh, looking inside of, and knowing what's in your heart now, not what was when you were a kid. Uh, you, and that's, you know, simple, straightforward. Everybody knows this to be true, and it is. Follow your heart and have the courage to look in to see what is actually there. Um, don't be afraid to identify the people who really matter to your future because they're probably a little bit different than those who matter to you in the past. Wow, very so well said. Think, you know, think carefully about who, who you're... That's why uh, I like the term stakeholder because it's who has a stake in your future. Not who owned you in the past or who mattered to you in the past, but... you know. Uh, it's all about forward looking in light of your history. Um, and the third piece is, uh, is strive to be kind and good in the world by learning how what is distinctive about you can be of use to other people. So it's, it's continual learning in the service of people around you. Um, those, that, that's a, a pretty amazing list. And uh, thanks for sharing it. I, I don't think it's the same as last time, not that I remember exactly, but uh, if, it's, if it's the same general idea as you put two of those about as succinctly as I've ever heard those things put, so kudos. Uh, I, I will be sharing those uh, on, on Facebook and all because uh, just perfectly, perfectly elucidated concepts uh, and ones I, I would agree with. Those are really valuable. Well, Stu, glad you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stu, your book. Leading the Life You Want, Skills for Integrating Work and Life is on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, at your local indie bookstore, all those places. It's, it's a, a well-received, well-respected book. If you listen to the show regularly, uh, I have a good number of authors on here. I, I, I recommend, in fact, I, I wouldn't have them on if their books weren't worth reading, but you know, Stu's is there. If you're dealing with work stress at all or some life stress, things aren't lined up, it, it, this is a good read. It, it really is. Stu, where can people find more about you, more about the Coursera course or whatever else? Just give me the URLs. We'll put them in the show notes so people can come to the website and download yeah. it. Uh, TotalLeadership.org is a place where you get a lot of information about what we've been talking about here. And the other website that is fun to visit is uh, if you just Google on Wharton Work Life, you'll find our Wharton site there. And the research, practice, teaching, and impact work that we're doing uh, at Wharton might be of interest. Awesome. Thanks again for being on Bulletproof Radio today, Stu. I've got great respect for you and for your work, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you.